Pablo Escobar's Endgame, The Final 100 Days What drives a man to the brink of power and terror? Delve deep into the mind of Pablo Escobar through a unique blend of intimate conversations, dramatic reenactments, and first-hand accounts. Experience the heart-stopping intensity of the Avianca and DAS bombings and get a glimpse behind the opulent walls of La Cathedral. Watch his family struggle amidst the chaos and witness the shifting allegiances of allies turned foes. This documentary invites you on an unparalleled journey through the final, electrifying phase of the King of Cocaine's reign. Join us as we uncover Escobar's Endgame, The Final 100 Days. Chapter 1 Setting the stage, Gaviria's gamble, negotiating with the kingpin. As the 1990s dawned, Colombia was at a crossroads. The power and influence of the drug cartels, particularly the Medellin cartel led by Escobar, had reached staggering proportions. With the nation's institutions stretched to their limits and drug-related violence surging, a new player entered the fray, determined to change the trajectory of this bloody narrative. President Cesar Gaviria. Gaviria, a forward-thinking and yet pragmatic leader, understood the need for unconventional solutions. With the weight of international pressure and the haunting specters of Avianca Flight 203 and the DAS building bombing behind him, he made a move that many saw as controversial, opening negotiations with the King of Cocaine himself. Shift to reenactment, a dimly lit room, the murmur of voices, one side of the table is President Gaviria and his advisors, on the other, the emissaries of Escobar. Emissary, Senor Escobar is willing to surrender, but he has conditions. Gaviria, we are listening. Emissary, he'll serve a prison term, but it will be in a facility of his own making. No extradition to the US, and he wants guarantees for the safety of his family. The audacity of the demand was emblematic of Escobar's power. A private prison, where he could serve his sentence on his own terms. To many, this sounded like a farce, but to Gaviria, it was a potential solution, a chance to curtail the bloodshed, even if it meant affording luxuries to a criminal. The result, La Cathedral. Perched high in the mountains overlooking Medellin, this prison was unlike any other. Equipped with a soccer field, a bar, and even a waterfall, it was less a place of penitence and more a fortress for the drug lord. Yet, behind this facade of a truce lay the intricate machinations of power, the dance between a nation desperate for peace and a kingpin unwilling to relinquish control. The stage was set, and as events would unfold, this uneasy compromise would catalyze the dramatic endgame for Pablo Escobar. Chapter 2 Eluding capture, the night Escobar vanished. La Cathedral, while outwardly a symbol of Escobar's unprecedented power, soon became a cauldron of tension. As reports leaked of continued criminal activities orchestrated from within its walls, and tales of luxuries and parties defying the very idea of incarceration, the national outcry grew. The Colombian government, having been seen as bending too far, was now pushed to a decision point. Amidst mounting pressure, the Gaviria administration made the call to transfer Escobar to a conventional prison. But the king of cocaine was not one to be cornered easily. Transition to reenactment, a hushed meeting inside La Cathedral. Escobar, flanked by his trusted associates like Popeye and El Chopo, receives word of the government's plans. Associate, Pablo, word is they're coming to move you. It's not just a rumor anymore. Escobar, visibly agitated, they think they can cage me like an animal in some dungeon. We need a plan. Popeye, we have ears everywhere. We'll know when they're coming. All paths down the mountain are secured. The decision was made. Escobar would not be transferred, he would escape. as the search block and Colombian military closed in. But La Cathedral, designed with Escobar's intimate knowledge of the terrain, was a maze of hidden exits and escape routes. The tight-knit group, always a step ahead, 
used the darkness and the chaos to their advantage, melting away into the dense forest surrounding the facility. When dawn broke, the inescapable truth became clear. The world's most notorious drug lord had slipped through the fingers of the Colombian government, plunging the nation into a new chapter of uncertainty. The hunter had become the hunted, and the final, tumultuous days of Pablo Escobar had truly begun. Chapter 3 Elusive Shadows, Escobar's Fugitive Days Freedom, for Pablo Escobar post La Cathedral, was a double-edged sword. No longer confined within his luxurious walls, the vast Colombian landscape lay before him. But every shadow held a potential threat, every unfamiliar face, a possible informant. Escobar, who once ruled a vast empire from sprawling estates, now found himself constantly on the move, ducking the relentless pursuit of both the Colombian government and rival cartels. Yet, even in this desperate state, Escobar was not alone. By his side were two of his most loyal and ruthless Sicarios, Limon and Popeye. Their unyielding loyalty and street smarts were invaluable during this treacherous period. Shift to reenactment, a dimly lit hideout, rain pounding on tin roofs. Maps of Medellin lay spread out, with radio scanners buzzing in the background. Escobar, looking visibly wearier but still determined, converses with Limon and Popeye. Escobar, we need to keep moving. No staying in one place for more than two nights. Popeye, pointing at the map, we have safe houses here, here, and here. All low profile, away from the city's hustle. Limon, and we've set up a network of lookouts. The moment there's any unusual activity, we'll know. Escobar, pausing, trust no one completely. Everyone has a price. We need to be smarter, faster. During these tumultuous days, Escobar's movements became the stuff of urban legend. Rumors swelled of sightings across the country, from remote villages to bustling urban centers. There were whispers of him disguising himself, of close calls with authorities, and of continued negotiations with the government for another surrender. But through it all, one fact remained. Pablo Escobar, despite the vast resources marshaled against him, remained elusive. His life on the run, a testament to his will to survive and the unwavering loyalty of those few who still stood by him. Chapter 4 Converging Forces, The Net Titans on Escobar The shadow of Pablo Escobar loomed large over Colombia, but the void created by his escape from La Cathedral gave rise to formidable adversaries, bent on his downfall. Enter Los Pepes, a vigilante group whose name stood as a chilling acronym for Persegidos por Pablo Escobar or people persecuted by Pablo Escobar. At the helm of Los Pepes were the Castano brothers, who had their own score to settle with Escobar. These brothers, fueled by personal vendettas and a thirst for power, systematically targeted Escobar's network, dismantling his empire piece by piece. Parallelly, the Colombian government had its own weapon against the fugitive lord, Colonel Hugo Martinez's elite unit, the Search Bloc. Relentless and determined, they became an ever-present shadow, dogging Escobar's every move. Shift to reenactment, a clandestine meeting room, dim lights cast long shadows on the walls. The Castano brothers, alongside other members of Los Pepes, gather around a table littered with documents, photographs, and intel. Carlos Castano, every day Escobar remains free, is a symbol. We need to shatter that. Attack his finances, his allies, his family. Fidel Castano, we've got leads on some of his associates. Time to send a message. No one associated with Escobar is safe. Another member, we've also got insiders in Medellin. They're feeding us information. The net is tightening. The combined pressure of Los Pepes and the search block was unlike anything Escobar had faced before. Los Pepes, with their brutal tactics, left a trail of bodies in their wake, signaling to the world that Escobar's reign was coming to an end. Yet, amidst this unyielding pressure, 
Escobar continued his desperate bid for survival, even as the walls closed in from all sides. The stage was set for a dramatic showdown, a convergence of vengeance, ambition, and the unyielding march of justice. Chapter 5 In his wake, the Escobar family's quest for sanctuary. Behind the fearsome facade of Pablo Escobar, beyond the tales of ruthlessness and empire, there was another narrative, that of a family man. To his wife, Maria Victoria, son, Juan Pablo, and young daughter, Manuela, he was not the king of cocaine, but a husband and father. Yet, in the treacherous landscape of drug wars and vendettas, the family became the most palpable vulnerability in Escobar's armor. As the net tightened around Escobar, the safety of his family came into sharp focus. With the weight of his enemy's vendetta and the relentless pursuit by the Colombian government, finding safe haven became paramount. Transition to reenactment, a plush hotel suite, dimly lit, with the hum of Medellin's night outside. Maria Victoria is on the phone, her voice a mix of desperation and determination. Maria Victoria, we need asylum. We are not safe here. My children, they deserve a chance at a normal life. On the other end, diplomatic murmurs, non-committal and wary of the implications of sheltering the family of the world's most wanted man. The family's odyssey took them from one country to another, seeking refuge. For a brief period, they found solace in the luxurious confines of Hotel Tequendama in Bogota, but the sanctuary was fleeting. The world was watching, and few nations were willing to risk the ire of hosting the Escobars. Juan Pablo, to his mother, every time someone looks at us, I feel like they see him, not us. We are trapped by his shadow. Manuela, clutching a doll, when will Papa come? I want to go home. The family's plight was a poignant reminder of the human cost of Escobar's choices. Stripped of their privileges and constantly under the gaze of the world, they were pawns in a larger game, their fates intertwined with the looming fate of Pablo Escobar. Chapter 6 Endgame in Medellin, Escobar's Last Stand The closing act in the long, tumultuous saga of Pablo Escobar was an intricate dance of technology, strategy, and sheer human determination. The labyrinthine streets of Medellin, which had for so long protected and nurtured Escobar's rise, became the stage for his final moments. Brigadier Hugo Martinez, a stalwart who had for years been locked in this game of cat and mouse with Escobar, was at the helm. His resolve was personal and unyielding, further steeled by his son's direct involvement in the operations. Transition to reenactment, inside a tech-laden room buzzing with activity, Officers are hunched over equipment, headphones pressed tight as they monitor communications. Officer, we have a call. It's Juan Pablo, connecting to a known frequency. The room falls silent, the weight of the moment pressing down. Through the static, Escobar's voice emerges, speaking to his son. Escobar, Juan, how are you all holding up? I'll find a way for us to be together again. Juan Pablo, Papa, we need to be careful. Everything's being watched. As the conversation unfolds, technicians triangulate the signal, narrowing down Escobar's location. Every second is crucial. Martinez, urgently, lock down that location. This is our moment. With the location pinpointed, a flurry of radio communications ensues. Radio. Target located, Los Olivos area. Proceed with caution. As teams move in, the streets of Medellin echo with the sounds of sirens, shouts, and the inevitable confrontation. The search block, trained and ready, converge on a nondescript house. Inside, Escobar, realizing the end is near, makes his last stand gunfire reverberate, a crescendo that marks the end of an era. Radio, after a tense pause, it's done. Escobar is down. Silence follows, save for the collective sigh of a nation. The giant shadow that had loomed large over Colombia for so long was finally laid to rest. 
The legacy of Pablo Escobar, with its blend of ruthlessness, ambition, and tragedy, had reached its final chapter. Chapter 7. Shifting Sands, Colombia Beyond Escobar. In the wake of Pablo Escobar's death, a country paused, exhaling a breath it had held for decades. The streets of Medellin, once battlegrounds in Escobar's relentless war, became sites of spontaneous gatherings. Joy, relief, sorrow, and introspection melded into a complex tapestry of emotions. In Bogota, the seat of Colombian power, there was a palpable sense of triumph. The government had rid itself of its most glaring challenge, and yet, the spectre of drug trade loomed large. Nature, after all, abhors a vacuum. Transition to reenactment, a plush office, lavish in its decorations. The Rodriguez Orajola brothers, leaders of the Cali cartel, sit sipping drinks, their expressions a mix of contemplation and ambition. Gilberto Rodriguez Orajola, with Escobar gone, the landscape has changed. The world is watching Colombia, expecting another kingpin. Miguel Rodriguez Orajola, smirking, then let's not disappoint them. But we'll be smarter. No more wars on the streets, it's time for boardrooms and politics. The Cali cartel, once operating in the shadows of the Medellin cartel, saw its moment. Their approach was different, more corporate, less flamboyant, and deeply embedded in the structures of society. The world had rejoiced at the fall of one titan, unaware that another was rising, more potent and dangerous. Yet, amidst these power shifts, Colombia itself was undergoing a metamorphosis. The death of Escobar, while a significant milestone, was a symbol of the larger struggle the nation grappled with. A struggle between its past and its aspirations, its scars, and its hopes. As the sun set on the Escobar era, the streets echoed with the voices of a resilient people, determined to reclaim their narrative and reshape their destiny. The aftermath was not just about the rise of another cartel or the power dynamics of the underworld. It was about a nation's journey towards healing and redemption. Chapter 8. Echoes of Escobar, Beyond the Kingpin Paradigm. The fall of Pablo Escobar was a turning point in the global war on drugs. The face of the menace had been vanquished, but the beast, the vast intricate web of narcotics trade, continued to evolve, shapeshift, and find new patrons. Across the globe, the names changed but the narrative persisted. The Rodriguez Orajola brothers in Colombia, El Chapo in Mexico, new figureheads of a relentless tide that refused to ebb. Transition to clips, rapid news snippets showcasing drug seizures, raids, and arrests. DEA operations and mugshots of apprehended cartel members. Yet, the enduring legacy of Escobar and the operations to curtail him wasn't just about the war on cartels, but a larger reflection on the socio-economic forces, political complexities, and the insatiable global appetite for narcotics. Shift to interview setup, a former search block member, older, with graying hair, eyes that have seen too much. Ex-search block member, after Escobar, we thought things might slow down. But the machine, it just had new operators. Our work, it never really ended. Cut to a retired DEA agent, weathered and contemplative. DEA agent, in tackling Escobar, we tackled a symptom of a deeper ailment. The real challenge is addressing the demand, the systems, and the societal gaps that let these cartels thrive. In the grand tapestry of the drug trade, Pablo Escobar remains a potent chapter, a vivid illustration of ambition unchecked and power's dual-edged nature. But his story, and the stories that followed, serve as enduring reminders, that while individuals may fall, ideologies persist, that for every Escobar vanquished, the underlying structures await their next champion. As the screen fades, perhaps the most poignant lesson is this, the true victory doesn't lie in the defeat of a kingpin but in understanding and addressing the very ecosystem that births them.